I am Joseph Kufite, the Director of the Center for Migration Studies at the University of Ghana. I am happy to welcome you all to this webinar on migration governance. This webinar is part of the Migration for Inclusive African Growth NIAT webinar series, which is being organized by the NIAT Research Consortium that is led by the Open University in UK, with partners in Ghana, Kenya, Mozambique, and Nigeria. Before we begin, I would like to share a brief housekeeping information. The webinar is being interpreted for us in Portuguese, so you can switch the language by pressing the interpreter button on Zoom. The event will be available to watch again next week. Follow us on Twitter and please tweet. The link will pop up in the Q&A now. Please sign up to our monthly newsletter at the Open University to keep up to date with our series of engaging events. Invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, today's webinar, which is on migration governance, is the third webinar of the MIAG webinar series. Last week, we had a two webinars. The first one was on inclusive growth and migration. The second one was on diaspora engagement. In today's webinar, which is on migration governance, I will lead a discussion on how successful existing policies have been and how regional and national migration frameworks work in practice. We will be discussing a lot of issues on policy formulation, policy implementation. We also discuss a lot of issues on capacity for migration policy implementation and also international cooperation. Based on the Nyang study, we have a few findings which were shared last week already, but I will repeat for the sake of those who are joining for the first time. Our studies, which were conducted in Ghana, Kenya, Mozambique, and Nigeria, indicate that national policies have been developed to govern migration in many of these countries, but they are unevenly implemented. In some countries, some ministries are doing very well to implement them. In other countries, not much has been done. The governments are making effort to harness the benefits of migration for socioeconomic development. And the governments are aware that immigrant businesses are potential sources of tax revenue. But the study indicates that most of the immigrants feel that the policies that we are implementing are biased towards the big marginal businesses. The small marginal businesses have not been really considered in the policy. The webinar will enable us to discuss some of these issues. The format for the webinar is as follows. Each of the presenters will do a small presentation of eight to 10 minutes. After the presentation, I'll ask a few questions and then we will go straight to the Q&A session. Please use the chat box to type your questions so that I will read them when we get to the Q&A session. At this juncture, I would like to introduce the panelists based on their brief bios. So I will start with my first panelist, who is Mr. Peter Modungwe. He has an economics degree from the University of Zimbabwe and a master's in human resource development for the University of Manchester. He worked for IOM and the African Caribbean and Pacific ACP Migration Facility managing migration and development project between 2004 and 2014. And has also worked with the African Diaspora Policy Center and the European Union Commission on Migration Issues in Africa. Peter sits on the advisory board of the University of Coventry's UK Research Innovation, which we normally call the South-South Migration in the Quality and Development Hub, and is a migration advisor to the African Union Commission. He is also a technical advisor at the African Union's African Center for the Study and Research on Migration, which is now based in Bamako. The second speaker is Mr. Charles Alan Pueni, who is the IOM Regional Director for Southern Africa. He has been instrumental in establishing various regional consultative processes on migration in Africa. 
Some of them can be listed here. They include ECOWAS or what we call the MIDWA, the IGAD, the ECAS, the COMESA, the IOC, consultative processes. He also pioneered the Pan African Forum on Migration. Charles has held multiple roles within IOM, including Senior Regional Advisor for Africa in Geneva, Chief of Mission to Ethiopia in Uganda, and IOM representative to the AUC, UNICA, and IGAD. He previously worked in the Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning in Ghana. Peter holds a master degree in public administration and management, a postgraduate diploma in development policy from State University of Antwerp, and a Bachelor of Science in Development Economics from the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology based in Ghana. The third speaker is Professor Alison Phipps, who holds the UNESCO Chair in Refugee Integration through Language and the Arts, and is a professor of languages and intercultural studies at the University of Glasgow. She, is a P she was a PI of the AHRC language grant entitled Researching Multilingually at the Borders of Language, the Body, Law, and the State. She co-directs the 20 million pound South-South Migration Hub, MIDEC, and is a PI of an AHRC 22 million cultures for sustainable and inclusive peace network plus. She regularly advises public, governmental, and third sector bodies on migration as and language policy and chairs the Scottish government's new Scott score group. She is an academic activist and published poet. The last but not the least is Dr. Tony Melu, who is currently the acting director of ECOWAS Private Sector Directorate. He previously worked in the Nigeria Immigration Service and retired voluntarily on controller cat there to assume an appointment as head of division, free movement and migration at ECOWAS Commission. Dr. Emelu is a subject matter expert on immigration and security issues within, the across, within and across the ECOWAS region and the African continent with over three decades of experience in migration governance in Africa. He is an accomplished migration and security expert having published widely on human migration, security, and regional development. He has facilitated the development of various collaborative agreements and support initiative between ECOWAS and the EU, including the development of ECOWAS National Biometric Identity Card and Regional Migration Policy. So with this rich experience, you agree with me that we have the best men and women on the table to discuss these issues. I would like to start with Mr. Peter Bodungui, who will give us an eight to 10 minutes presentation on the role of the African Commission in migration governance in Africa. And Peter will be happy if you can take some time also to talk about the programs and initiatives that have been adopted by the African Union Commission to ensure that migration contributes to inclusive growth and development in Africa. So Peter. Um, thank you, uh, Joseph, uh, for that um, generous intro introduction. Um, I would like to share my, my screen um, for the presentation. Um, is it appearing? It, it is appearing. If you can put it on slide mode, that would be better. Okay, yeah, that's what I'm that's what I'm doing. Uh, 
if it is not working, you can go ahead like that. Don't worry, we can still see it very well. Yeah, um, I'm sure. Is him share? Okay. Well, I haven't used webinar before. Yeah, well, it's fine. You can start. We are okay. We can see it still. Okay, um, I'll just continue uh, as is. Um, okay, um, my presentation is, uh, you know, Joseph uh, indicated um, is on the role of the AU Commission uh, in the area of migration governance uh, in Africa. And um, I'll just speak to the, uh, speak to my um, uh, presentation so that I don't wonder too much um, from what I intend to present. Now, in terms of the outline of the presentation, uh, I'm going to, uh, first of all to uh, provide the magnitude uh, characteristics and trends and the impact of uh, migration in Africa uh, before mo moving on to uh, the nexus uh, between migration governance and migration. And then uh, talk briefly about uh, the state of migration governance in Africa, and then look at um, migration governance in Africa and its implications on managing migration. And then lastly, I will look at, uh, you know, some of the responses of the AU Commission in addressing the um, migration governance uh, deficit. Well, in terms of, um, you know, the magnitude and characteristics, um, I, as you know, in recent times, um, immigration in Africa has grown uh, significantly. Um, and it's, uh, from uh, 15 million in 2000 to 27 million in 2019, which represents a 70 cent um, uh, increase. Um, and um, we've also experienced um, a growth um, in um, uh, people coming into, um, uh, into the continent uh, from just below 2.5 million in 1990 more than 5 million in uh, 2017. And currently, uh, in terms of, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 worldwide, you know, figures, um, Africa represents, uh, migration, migrants in Africa represent 2% of um, uh, the total population in Africa, uh, uh, compared to uh, 3.5, uh, the average, you know, uh, for, for the world. Now, the bulk of migration uh, happens on the continent, and uh, estimates are that about 80% um, of um, uh, migrants in Africa uh, migrate within the continent. Uh, and the rest, about 20%, uh, mostly to Europe, um, uh, the Gulf states, uh, Asia, and uh, North America. And um, um, findings are that um, the majority of African migrants, uh, when they move out, you know, whether it's within the court or abroad, uh, the majority have no intention of migrating permanently. Um, and another uh, effect is that um, uh, African migration is mainly intra-regional. Since people migrate mainly within uh, their respective uh, regions but they also cross uh, these uh, uh, regions. Um, and uh, I'll show um, um, a, a table um, that uh, shows this uh, film. As you can see, um, there is a strong uh, intra-regional migration in almost um, all the regions except uh, North Africa, um, where migrants from North Africa uh, may uh, migrating to Europe and to the uh, Gulf states. Um, now let's look at um, the impact of migration in Africa, um, both the positive and the negative uh, impact. Uh, the most obvious is uh, remittances, uh, which is uh, substantial in some countries um, and um, in some member states, um, uh, remittances uh, actually uh, outstrip uh, overseas development assistance and foreign direct investment. Um, and second, uh, they reduced uh, pressure on jobs um, and resources uh, in the sending countries, um, which has been termed actually exporting 
exporting unemployment. And uh, thirdly, the contribution of the diaspora uh, in the term of, uh, uh, in the form of deals uh, uh, when they return uh, back home and also investments uh, which they can make at tropic um, activities. Now, all the negative impacts, um, the, the, the most obvious is the brain drain um, to the countries um, uh, of origin, and then also de-skilling and uh, the possibility of uh, remittance induced inflation in migrant ascending countries. Um, and an area that hasn't uh, been researched much is the social consequences of migration um, on the family unit, uh, especially in those in cases where families are separated you know, due to uh, migration. Now, this uh, table shows um, remittances um, as a percentage of uh, GDP in selected African countries in 2018 and uh, 2019. Uh, now, as you can see, for South Sudan, uh, it, you know, the, the contribution is quite significant, um, constitutes about 34% of um, of uh, GDP. The, le, le, let's look at the nexus uh, between migration and develop. Uh, sorry, uh, between uh, migration governance and migration development. Now, um, as we have seen, uh, given the magnitude of migration in Africa um, and uh, the, the opportunities and uh, challenges that um, uh, it, it potentially, you know, presents, uh, it's important that. Um, uh, we as a continent begin to change uh, in the migration and the debate. And um, we define uh, migration development as um, the conscious effort to harness the positive aspects of migration for the benefit of development, at the same time uh, mitigating its uh, neg negative uh, impact. Now, um, with that definition of migration and development, um, and in order for the continent to harness uh, the potential benefits uh, of and uh, mitigate uh, the negatives or development outcomes, uh, this you know presupposes uh, African countries have the capacity to harness uh, migration for development, um, and that um, is the presence of um, robust migration governance regimes uh, in the member states, um, and. Um, let me just um, as well uh, provide the definition of um, what we mean by migration governance. Um, it is the common traditions and legal policy frameworks, as well as the institutional uh, arrangement uh, that shape the, uh, and regulate a country's approach to managing migration. So that's the uh, definition of my, uh, um, migration governance, uh, critical, um, especially as we. Um, move forward with uh, you know this discussion so then um the efforts to manage migration uh, in a coherent manner uh, and reap the positive benefits of migration um the presence of harmonized as we said you know uh, robust migration governance uh, systems uh, it requires the presence of harmonized uh, migration policies and legal frameworks that are integrated in the country's national development plans that means you know mainstreaming them into the development uh, uh, frameworks um, and uh, well coordinated and inclusive institutional um, uh, structures uh, for managing migration. But however, uh, the presence of migration policies uh, and legal frameworks and these institutional uh, mechanisms um, is uh, premised on the availability of uh, up to date um, um, uh, migration. Very, very uh, critical, and uh, further, it's important, you know, that um, uh, the migration policies, the legal frameworks, um, receive consistent implementation, uh, and are monitored and evaluated uh, regularly uh, in order to assess um, extent to which they are making an impact um, on uh, development uh, out. Now. Let's just look at the state of migration governance in Africa. Um, now, what we have been discussing now is the ideal situation, but uh, evidence uh, points to um, the fact that 
the majority of African countries, uh, to a large extent, uh, lack um, robust uh, migration governance uh, regimes. Uh, in fact, in, in 2016, we evaluated uh, the, the migration policy framework, uh, um, and we also conducted uh, a capacity build, uh, building needs assessment um, in governance um, in 2018. And these two assessments made a number of uh, you know, re uh, uh, revelations. Firstly, that uh, there is a scarcity of migration data uh, on which uh, you know, African countries can formulate evidence-based uh, policies uh, and begin to uh, programs for managing migration and uh, also capitalizing um, on the potential benefits of migration. Um, and uh, secondly, um, that um, ethical aspect of this death um, uh, in the in the availability of migration data um, uh, is that much of the available data is skewed in favor of countries uh, and regions on the continent uh, from which migrants move up or originate. Um, and, and this is because the major donors uh, for migration uh, uh, research and programs are, are from Europe. Um, and um, but you know that's despite you know the fact that uh, the bulk uh, on the continent is intra uh, uh, continental. Um, um, uh, thirdly, that uh, most member states do not have uh, migration policies, uh, and that of those countries that do have the migration policies, a significant number of the policies do not have uh, implementation plans, uh, don't have m and &E frameworks and uh, with uh, progress uh, and impact indicators. And that uh, further, uh, the frameworks of most countries are not integrated into the uh, national development plans of the respective uh, member states. And uh, with regard to the institutional mechanisms for managing migration, um, the observation was that very few countries have these mechanisms, either ministries or units or agencies uh, that are dedicated to the management of migration. Um, and equally, a few countries have got national coordinating mechanisms for migration. And I, pr I provide uh, a definition there of national coordinating mechanisms. Now, let's just look at uh, the role of uh, donor funding um, in Africa with respect to migration governance. Now, uh, donor funding uh, for migration activities um, is increased uh, quite uh, tremendously uh, on the continent in the two decades. And uh, it is mainly uh, from Europe uh, for obvious reasons. But uh, the paradox is that uh, why is migration governance weak uh, uh, against, you know, uh, amid, you know, this increased donor funding for migration in Africa? And uh, the answer can be found in the fact that um, uh, the EU um, um, the funding on migration in Africa uh, is actually focused more on uh, tightening uh, border uh, uh, and uh, preventing migration to Europe um, and combating uh, the trafficking in persons and smuggling of migrants instead of focusing on um, building the capacity of member states uh, um, and REX uh, um, um, migration governance uh, regimes. Now, what are the implications of um, migration governance? Firstly, um, uh, the, the manifestations of uh, weak migration governance um, are the reduced capacity of member states um, to firstly, to nature and fully um, um, or, or capitalize uh, on the uh, positives um, that migration can bestow towards uh, development outcomes. Uh, secondly, also the reduced capacity to mitigate the negative impact of migration, which is the flip side of it. And thirdly, uh, the, the capacity of member states uh, to effectively negotiate uh, migration compacts, you know, those countries that are negotiating migration compacts uh, with other countries or regions um, that are, you know, nation, uh, uh, countries for uh, African migrants. Well, the, the, the debate on, on migration compacts actually, I think, 
can warrant uh, uh, a webinar series uh, on its own. Um, but uh, that's a discussion for another day. Uh, now, um, let me now look at you know, some of the initiatives which the uh, AU is implementing in the area of uh, governance uh, to, uh, to address you know, the migration governance you know, deficit. <coughs> Sorry. Now, I mentioned earlier on about you know, the evaluation of the MPFA and um, the assessment that we conducted in 2018. Um, now, um, uh, following the observations, um, um, uh, sorry, for following these assessments, um, we made a number of observations which led to two watershed uh, decisions. Uh, firstly, that um, you know, since uh, the, the majority of mig migrants in Africa uh, move within the continent, and uh, since there are dividends that uh, um, um, uh, can be you know, harvested uh, from uh, managing migration in a coherent manner, uh, there is need uh, for the uh, Commission, uh, the RECs and the member states, uh, firstly, to get to grips with migration, uh, uh, migration as a uh, phenomenon that is occurring all over the continent um, um, uh, in a balanced manner, um, and that we need, you know, up-to-date uh, 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 information uh, on this. Um, secondly, that uh, much as the member states are aware of uh, the uh, issues they are facing in terms of migration. Um, there is a gap uh, between their commitment and the actual technical capacity uh, to manage migration. And then, uh, there is need um, to strengthen or to establish governance regimes uh, in member states and RECs. Um, and the underlying principle, uh, the uh, you know, underlying risk is, um, uh, is that uh, robust migration governance regimes regimes are fundamental uh, to the capacity of member states and RECs uh, to manage all other aspects uh, of migration, uh, be it labor migration, remittances, the management, uh, is irregular migration. So uh, basically what we're saying is have your migration governance uh, in place and then everything else uh, you know, falls in place. Uh, so with that in mind, um, the uh, commission took uh, two decisions, as I said. Uh, firstly was uh, the establishment of the AU Technical Assistance Facility on Migration Governance, uh, what we call the TAF. And uh, secondly, the establishment of Migration uh, Center um, uh, of Excellence. Uh, and I will touch on those in more detail. But just to mention that, uh, these centers, um, there's one uh, here in Bamako in Mali, uh, which is the African Center for the Study and Research on And then secondly, there's uh, the African Migration Observatory, uh, which is based in Rabat, uh, Morocco. And then the Continental Operational Center in Khartoum, uh, which looks at um, uh, managing uh, uh, migration. Now, centers, you know, all the three centers are specialized uh, technical agencies of the AU, and um, their broad aim is um, to enhance migration governance uh, in Africa. Now, just a look at um, the uh, technical assistance facility. Um, we established this in 2019, and the objective is to support member states and RECs uh, to establish uh, or strengthen uh, their migration governance regimes uh, by providing technical in uh, key um, six uh, key areas. Uh, firstly, conducting situational analysis migration and also formulating migration policies. Uh, secondly, to provide uh, training on migration governance and, um, by establishing or strengthening national uh, um, uh, or regional uh, informa uh, institutional mechanisms uh, for managing migration and um, uh, formulating and evaluating migration policies, and uh, fifth, uh, mainstreaming uh, these migration policy uh, national development uh, 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 strategies, and lastly, um, uh, to facilitate experience uh, sharing um, among uh, member states and RECs exchange uh, visits. Now, in uh, in terms of that uh, facility, we have. Um, between 2019 and 2021, we developed uh, 
uh, a training program uh, on migration governance, a five-day training program um, that uh, recently uh, completed. Um, and in fact, we are uh, currently training uh, one member state um, uh, online. In fact, we have also transformed uh, this uh, training uh, uh, program uh, into online training. And uh, also plans are underway uh, to, up to uh, um, upgrade uh, this training uh, into an accredited uh, course. And um, the uh, objective of this training is to uh, enhance um, uh, knowledge of experts from member states uh, and their skills on migration governance uh, and to provide them with guidance uh, on establishing migration governance regimes. And um, and these are some of the um, uh, these are some of the modules which are, are contained uh, in that uh, training program, uh, which, in the interest of time, I won't you know delve into those. Uh, now, um, also work in progress. We are currently developing two training modules: migration governance. Uh, uh, these are two-day uh, training uh, 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 runs. The first one being uh, for policymakers, uh, parliamentarians, and the second one uh, being for the media and uh, civil. So, uh, both are two-day uh, trainings. And uh, we are also uh, providing technical assistance to um, a number of, um, well, two uh, regional economic communities um, and also uh, a number of uh, member states. Now, in terms of um, the um, centers of excellence that I spoke about earlier on, um, the African Center for uh, and Research on Migration, uh, the Mali Center, uh, is the mandate uh, to conduct research and um, capacity building on uh, migration. And then the um, African Migration Observatory um, in Rabat um, has got the mandate to collect migration data and also to build the capacity of member states and RECs in co uh, um, uh, collecting uh, uh, data on migration. And then the Continental uh, Center in Khartoum um, uh, will provide um, a member states to share information and intelligence on um, trafficking persons and the smuggling of migrants. So it will have the mandate uh, to commission research on um, uh, transnational organized crime, uh, especially um, human trafficking and migrant uh, smuggling. Um, and also it will have a capacity building component um, on uh, in persons um, and uh, the smuggling of migrants uh, and also on border uh, man and uh, border governance. Now, these three centers uh, are, are going to work co collaboratively uh, with uh, each other and uh, with also other institutions uh, working on uh, similar uh, issues uh, in Africa and beyond. Uh, thank you. I hope I didn't overrun uh, my time, Joseph. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that very comprehensive presentation, which has provided the context for the discussion. I will now want to move <coughs> on to the second speaker, Dr. Tony Elumelu. Can you tell us about the role of the ECOWAS Commission in Migration Governance? Can you highlight the policies and initiatives that have been adopted by the ECOWAS to ensure migration contributes to inclusive growth? So I'll be happy if you can be brief and do this for us within some eight minutes so we have time for questions. Thank you. Tony? Yeah, th thank you. I, I'm trying to share. Uh, my document. Now I'll be very, very concise because uh, uh, my colleague, um, Peter, has done justice to the. Can you see my screen? Not yet, but you can begin in the interest of time. If it shows up, fine. Okay. It's not showing yet. Okay. But well, let me just begin. start. Yes, the role please. of ECOWAS Commission in the Migration governance in the ECOWAS region and their specific roles and policies, programs, and initiatives. I want to like go straight. That the first is, um, like you said, ECOWAS, um, the Lagos Treaty, 
is built around the need for integration of the of the region. And um, the first uh, flagship protocol um, is the free movement of persons, goods, services, and uh, capital. And this also quickly followed by other trade relation, related um, um, and protocols. But having noted that um, mobility is not only the concern within the region, like we said, the majority of our people move within this space. And having um, noted that, it was also important to plan migration um, outside the region. How can you recall the high level dialogue, migration high level dialogue in the 2000s? And this um, was quickly followed by the need for ECOWAS to develop um, policies um, that will cover migration outside the region. And this is what about the ECOWAS common approach on migration that was adopted in 2000 in Ouagadougou. And this um, document uh, outlines six capital axes in terms of intervention, the, 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 the framework of press sense was seen as um, critical to the um, migration management. Then also you have the actions relating to regular migration. How can um, we manage migration in the region? Beyond that one, again, we found that um, it was also important uh, to, to look at um, migration taking into cognizance at the gender dimension. Beyond that one, again, we had uh, also the document enshrined to look at the uh, migration, um, irregular migration, gender, mainstreaming gender, harmonization of policies, then um, taking, um, drawing aspiration from the unfortunate war in Liberia, Sierra Leone, were also um, mainstream uh, migration leading to asylum and um, uh, as, asylum and refugees. But we also knew that it was not comprehensive enough because if you look at the document, it, it was, um, um, it lacked um, uh, cohesion. No linkages between the national actions and the regional action. Beyond that one, again, we didn't have um, uh, to share rules in terms of um, who is going to do what, and who's not going to do what. Lastly, it wasn't comprehensive enough because you look at issues relating to climate change, they were not all addressed in this particular document. Um, having said that, what is now the role of ECOWAS in terms of migration governance? The first is to encourage uh, the regional integration agenda, mainstreaming migration in our regional integration agenda in realization of the ECOWAS vision 2020. As we discussed this, the ECOWAS vision 2020 is transiting from the ECOWAS of states, so that of the people, making sure that it's a people-centered uh, migration uh, uh, policy. Then one of the, again, is the, uh, our role is to, is to enhance coherent policy development, both at the national level, by agreeing a joint regional framework, drawing also the aspiration from the continental free movement agenda, like we have policy. And if you look at it again, the ECOWAS Commission and other stakeholders um, enhance the capacities of member states based on the objectives of the policy formulated in, 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 at, the, at the ECOWAS um, level. The Commission also clarifies specific rules of regional and national stakeholders, what are the governmental and non governmental. There's also one of the duties that we do is also the identification of synergies, common objectives, and um, this will reduce duplication. Beyond that, again, uh, we also encourage dialogue with the coordination of donors. And uh, it is very important to state that uh, the region has also been assisted seriously within the framework of ECOWAS EU fund, so ECOWAS Spain fund the Swiss fund. Um, this also strengthened what they call um, the, the MIDWA, Migration Dialogue in West Africa. The Migration Dialogue in West Africa is a forum that um, 
where all issues relating to migration that cannot be discussed at the national level only are brought to the regional forum. We have been able to institutionalize the border management group, the thematic areas and level, return and reintegration, data, migration and climate change. We're also looking at migration and security and others that will come on board. Also, um, what we're in at ECOWAS is, is, um, is working directly with the, with the AU, because as you see it, well, it's a, a, a new way, we change the paradigm in terms of migration management. We want to key into the continental free movement, just like we have done that regional trade. So continental trade. So these are the things that we have done. So you now ask again, what are the policies and pillars? What, where did they go in regional migration policy? The first again is the free movement that we cherish so much, that 91% or above of our regional integration movement is within the region. Then this formed the nine policy key pillars in terms of our regional migration. Uh, the border management would also take trafficking, cross-border crime, managing level migration and student mobility, enhancing the migration and development measures, strengthening and protection of the people on the move, harnessing and the, the, the gender dimension in migration, like I mentioned before, addressing the impact of climate change. And very important for our region is the data management of migration. Like I mentioned before, that we've been able to institutionalize uh, a thematic group on data. Then all this culminates to the regional migration governance. Beyond this one, again, I want to let you know, under the framework arrangement, we've had um, uh, protocols that has enabled us to institutionalize mobility of residents and establishment. Then also giving us the, con the concept of citizenship, that is the, 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 the community citizenship, 1982. We've also done the right of establishment, like I mentioned before, then also additional protocol in terms of management of migration is the one relating to the border management where we have developed the common passport and demystify travel by using the ID card to travel in our region. So having said this again, we have also gone beyond that one. I'm sure you know the issue relating to transhumans. Um, there are also protocol. I just read it saying this so that um, I will meet, I want to respect the time and uh, have, um, uh, questions answered. But within this area, we've been able to like um, uh, develop strategies in terms of um, making sure that we look at the, at the vision, the regional vision. And the regional vision is to make sure that we prepare ourselves to key into the continental free movement agenda. It is very, very important. However, it is not all that easy. There are problems and challenges in terms of uh, implementation of these policies. First is the lack of awareness. You see, the policies are developed. And also it is important that member states take it to the grassroots. It's also important that we respect text, irrespective of whether there are sanctions or not. Beyond that one, again, we know that um, there's paucity of fund in terms of capacity building. We need also to know that those who are implementing this, those in the enforcement will also need to, to understand the dynamics of the region. First of all, to stop being territorial. And look at the concept of the regional integration. They hide under the guise of national security. But we know that integrated border management requires that you create measures, information sharing. The most police states are not the most visible police officers. It is where you have, you implement the integrated border management, sharing of information, data issues, timely intervention. Then finally, for, for, for under this, we also have, uh, like I mentioned, positive of fund. We also have um, the belief what migration is seen in our region. And migration has not really been owned by the people of our region. You see, we see migration the only when we talk about the benefits, remittances, or whatever it is. But right now, there's a big challenge. Migration and the border management in COVID era and post-COVID era. Whether we like it or not, there's a problem. It is easy to fly and travel by air. Despite the fact that we have provided the guidelines in travel, land, sea, air, but it's difficult also to travel by land because of, um, uh, of discretionary acts of member states. 
closing of borders and all those um, issues that, are, that does not respect the text. Um, I would like to like keep to my time. I'll share this and uh, with these few points, I think, um, I hope I've been able to like uh, touch on the itty gritty of where I'm called to present. Thank you, Professor Taylor. Thank you so much, Tony, for that brilliant presentation, very concise, and then thank you for respecting the time as well. I will now move on to Mr. Charles Queenie, who will just tell us a few things about the role of the IOM in migration governance in Africa. So Mr. Queenie, can you share your views on the role of IOM? I'll be happy if you can do that within eight minutes or even under, so that we can take on more questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Tay, and good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, really, firstly, let me thank the organizers for inviting me to share a few perspectives on the role of IOM uh, in migration governance in Africa. Certainly, <laughs> eight, 10 minutes is a, a challenge, but I'll try in the interest of time so that we can have more time for uh, interactive uh, discourse. But let me first underline a few uh, basic uh, principles. Um, that is one, we live in an era of uh, the greatest human mobility at the moment, because we have about 281 million people as of 2020 living outside their countries, or countries of uh, birth. And if we should put this in a sovereign state, that means we're talking about perhaps the fourth biggest country, uh, most populous country in the world, or the, a country the size of, say, Indonesia and the GDP of a middle-income country like Norway or Austria in Europe. But at the same time, this also raises a number of questions, which I believe this webinar will help to uh, deliberate upon. And that is to say that the patterns of migration flow today is much more complex than it used to be. Because if we look at the current statistics, for instance, in the South Africa region, where I'm speaking from now, it's estimated about 6.9 million of the uh, population here are migrants, of which about 75% come from the uh, SADC region, mostly uh, residing in South Africa. But first, we have to work together to manage these flows. I also dare to say that there is no magic formula, no one that is universally applicable. Our responsible migration policy is one that, on one hand, is a policy that respects national sovereignty in determining who enters a country and those who do enter will uphold and respect the local laws and customs. But on the other hand, it's also a policy that respects the age old desire for people to migrate to seek better life. So to manage this, for IOM, it is an irony that for countries that used to pride themselves in being a nation of migrants are now those who no longer want to welcome them. But at the same time, we can no longer think of uh, our economies or societies or cultures without thinking about human mobility because after all, migration is inevitable. We cannot stop it. It's necessary and desirable if it is well managed. But then how do we manage migration? It's not so easy. And that is why for Iowa, we've come up with a migration governance framework because there is no single document or convention regulating the way states govern migration. Instead, states govern migration according to domestic laws and policies framed by international standards. But at the same time, there have been some significant commitments and thinking such as the Global Compact on uh, Migration. So for Iowa, migration governance framework sets out a coherent, comprehensive and balanced vision for migration. And that is if we have to achieve migration governance, it will have to ensure that migration is humane, orderly, and benefits migrants and society for that matter. So migration governance, therefore, pulls together all aspects of migration governance, including protection, assistance, humanitarian action, development, and administration into a coherent whole. So the migration framework sets out, you know, in which case, when we talk of governance here, is seen from the viewpoint of a state. That is the traditions and institutions by which authority on migration, mobility, and nationality in a country is exercised, including the capacity of the government to effectively 
formulate and implement sound policies in these areas. At the same time, a state also retains the sovereign right to determine who enters and stays in its territory and under what conditions within the framework of international laws. But at the same time, there are others who also contribute to this, including the citizens, uh, migrants, international organizations such as IOM, the private sector, uh, trade unions, and also non-state activists and community religious organizations and academia that contribute to migration governance through their interaction with states and each other. So let me underline just three key principles for that matter so that we have more time for an interactive discourse. But I will say that a state ensures that migration is humane and orderly and benefits migrants when it adheres to international standards and fulfills migrants' rights. Two, when it formulates policies, uses evidence and whole of government approach. Three, when it engages with partners to address migration and related issues. And at the same time, it's also important that the state advance the socioeconomic well being of migrants and society and effectively address the mobility dimension of crisis when it occurs, because sometimes we cannot uh, help it and ensure that migration takes place in a safe, orderly, and dignified way. So, the three principles that I want to underline is the fact that one, good migration governance requires a state to adhere to international standards and to fulfill migrants' rights, including compliance with international law, protection of rights, including combating xenophobia, discrimination, racism, and all that, identification, assistance, and protection of vulnerable migrants, including victims of trafficking, access to justice and legal redress, criminalization of forced labor, human trafficking, and smuggling. The second principle is evidence and whole of government approach, because a state should first and foremost formulate migration related policies using evidence and whole of government approaches because migration is multifaceted, different aspects being dealt with by different uh, ministries and we need uh, data and free partnership because a state cannot govern migration in isolation. It needs strong partnership. So far when we work with the Africa Union, the Rex, ECOWAS, EGAD, SADC and the rest, uh, NEPA, you know, to ensure that uh, to ensure migration governance. But at the same time, this frames what our support to governments at the, at the global, regional, continental, and at the national level, including the achievements of the uh, Global Compact on uh, Migration, the GCM 23 objectives. So to wind up, let me just outline a few of the activities that we undertake within the framework of uh, migration governance. At the policy level, we've been working with the, Afri the Africa Union in the drafting of the Continental Migration Policy Framework and the Africa Common Position on Migration and Development. At the regional level, we've been uh, supporting EGAT in drafting the Regional Migration Policy Framework. And uh, as I speak, we're also working with SADC to come up with uh, their draft migration and regional policy framework, as well as the uh, Labor Migration Action Plan. The, at the national level, we've been developing, helping governments to develop national migration policies, labor migration policies, diaspora policies, and the, uh, the implementation of the global compact uh, objectives. And some of these uh, issues towards economic development is diaspora engagement. That is the mobilization of diaspora resources, skills, remittances to support the socioeconomic development of migrants. We've been training government officials through the, our Africa Capacity Building Center where we've uh, trained over 7,600 government officials from all the African uh, countries, including informal uh, cross-border trade, which contributes to inclusive development, especially addressing issues of gender, because uh, about 70% of cross-border mobility and trade is undertaken by uh, women. So, uh, Prof, in order to save time, let me just conclude by saying that for IOM, the issue of mobility, and international migration is critical towards inclusive uh, development and growth. Because when we look at the Africa continental free trade, we're talking of free movement of goods and services. Our governments have adopted the continental free trade uh, area, but the protocol of free movement of persons is still yet to be adopted. And one would wonder how do we expect goods and services to move without the people moving when we know that the goods and services are moved by people. 
So that is one critical question that we need to address. And also the coordination and harmonization of policies that will ensure that. So to conclude, let me say that IOM applies the migration governance framework to guide the you know, activities of the organization, including supporting capacity building and training and developing programs to support member states. Whilst at the same time, we also encourage member states to use the migration governance framework to enhance their own governance on migration and mobility with the support of Iowa. Because as I said, no single country can govern migration. It takes collective effort. It takes partnership at the global level, at the at continental level, at the regional level, and even at the national level, where we need a coordination of the various ministries. So let me pause here so that we have more time for an interactive discourse, and I'm available to really respond to any issues or clarify any of the points. Raised. Thank you so much, Mr. Queenie, for that concise presentation as well. We take our last presentation, so that is a question for Professor Alison Fields. So Alison, can you tell us about the role of researchers like you and then also advocacy groups in migration governance? And I know you've done a lot on artistic methodologies, which I am learning from you through our partnerships. So can you also share light on how artistic methods can be used to generate data to inform uh, migration governance? Thank you, Alison. I'll be happy if you can do it within the eight minutes. Thank you so much, Professor Tay, and also to my colleagues, um, Charles, Peter, and Tony, um, and to the interpreters as well for the hard work that you're doing, making sure that this work, this important work is understandable. Um, I want to begin with a quotation from the great Ghanaian poet, Professor Kofi Anidaho, where he says, we lost our breath to the hostile winds. He says that in the context of the genocidal migration that constituted slavery. But I hear those words when I think of the comments made recently to our Deputy First Minister here in Scotland by Dr. Hia Johannes. Dr. Hia Johannes is a torture and trafficking survivor, as well as a UNESCO Ryla PhD holder who came to Scotland from Eritrea. And he said, that bad migration governance on the continent and Africa and Europe, including in the UK, has put the border in our bodies. It has deported us, detained us, destituted us, humiliated us and shamed us in front of our families. In saying those words, it put the border in our bodies. He was of course referring to the biometrics but also to the ways in which technologies of migration governance, securitization and militarization have affected and changed and shaped and shamed those who have attempted to, quote Charles, tried to seek a better life. Or even perhaps if we modify that language, tried to seek life. So, I want to say those words, the border in our bodies, because they have a poetic resonance. They are themselves, if you like, strips of data taken out of the discourse, the critical discourse that is uttered by people when we speak with them or listen to them and understand their work as qualitative data. And the qualitative data that has been gathered in interviews across projects like our own within MIDEC or CUSP, these projects funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council and by the Economic and Social Research Council in the UK. These are strips of data which index something really critical about migration and migration governance because the way that this data is used, whether it is used indeed, as Charles has said, as Peter has said, and as Tony has said before me, to uphold human rights and the right to migrate, or whether it is used in ways which might curtail those rights is the critical question. And I hear my colleagues, particularly critical colleagues within the arts and humanities at the moment, um, beginning to wonder whether more data, such as the data that has been generated in great degree for the continent of Europe, is actually going to be useful 
given the extent to which Europe, European migration strategies and governance has actually curtailed human rights and even been in violation of human rights in recent years. We look particularly at the expulsion of migrants and the externalization of migrants coming from Libya and being returned to Libya, um, despite all of the compacts and agreements in recent, recent years, and the way that that has led to the, um, the disrespect of human rights for those migrants themselves. So that's one element that I just want to raise and say, more data is not in and of itself an answer. And what arts and humanities scholars would say and bring to this debate is the question of ethics and the extent to which that data is used ethically. Within the UK at the moment, we have done our work as researchers. We know the egregious effects of non-rights respecting migration governance within our own country. And yet it has not led to a change in migration governance or policy. If anything, the new plan for migration will be even more detrimental, particularly to migrants wishing to come to the UK from the African continent. I want to also refer to Peter's contribution of the 2% of exceptional people, migrants, who have, because they have migrated, migrated, exceptional stories that they carry in their bodies, in their lives, in their songs, in their culture, in their traditions. These intercultural experiences um, that are 2% of the continent of Africa, 3.5% of experiences worldwide. And Peter referred to the fact that the social consequences of these stories are under-researched. And I would want to say that the cultural consequences of these stories is barely researched at all. And yet everything is changed through and by culture, by the language we speak, the languages we share, the mother tongues shared with children that become children's tongues, daughter tongues and son's tongues that become the tongues that grandparents might then have to learn or relearn in order to connect with their grandchildren. At that grassroots level, there is a governance of migration in the language of the home that is an absolute core generator of the cultural traditions of hospitality that are part of the governance of migration the African governance of migration, part of the traditions that are laid down or changed within families of migrants. Understood from anthropology and the arts and languages, mig migration governance is simply a form of human expression for good or ill, a cultural and international expression of how we have been influenced by others to shape our policies in the home, in the local community, in the regional, and also in the international sphere. But migration governance itself in each context sets the cultural tone from the home and the city-state, the ethos, the values of a state towards the implementation um, of, of authorities of what is governed. And therefore, whether governance is for a freedom of movement or for restricted movement, again, at all those levels of the home, the community, the village, the, the city, the region, the international state um, of affairs, then this is both an ideological and a political decision in terms of governance. But it might also be a decision taken to ungovern what is understood to be non-rights respecting forms of governance. It might be a decision to advocate, to change the laws and the charters, to change the blueprints laid down which might prevent migration or might manage it in a way that is inimical to human rights and change that. And the place where we see that generative possibility is, in, is within advocacy and within cultural work and artistic work. This at the moment is a critical point for migration governance in Africa. Uh, and a lot of the time what I see and what I see through research is a desire to mimic the data gathering and also the biometrics and the border controls and the securitization of previously nomadic movement, such as Tony um, referred to there. But I'd also like to plea for our taking seriously of the data of art. Ben Okri, the fabulous Nigerian Nobel Prize winning writer said that Africa breathes stories. 
Biometrics don't breathe stories, bodies do. The borders in bodies breathe stories. Samson Kambalu has recently been selected to have his work exhibited on the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square, a Malawian artist migrating stories into a superpower in the global north, but in doing so stating that it is the cultures within Africa that are the superpowers of Africa, that are part of ending the dominance of the cognitive empire and enabling epistemologies, cultural epistemologies in particular of the south, to be brought to bear. And in doing so, really bringing into focus the work of the great epistemological and legal scholar Boaventura de Souza Santos, who has said that we must, const we must change the world by constantly reinterpreting it. So what I think we need within migration governance strategies for Africa, yes, absolutely, is data data that is rigorous and robust, but data also that is rights respecting and data that is receptive to story, receptive to change, data which is able to be reinterpreted by artists from within the continent. And for me, what this means is um, bringing artists into those frameworks of governance. This has been done within conflict transformation and peace building by having artists in residence, by having we women alongside who weave or knit or create collages or work with textiles. This has been done by bringing poetry into the mix. In his Nobel lectures, Seamus Heaney spoke about governance of the tongue and about the work that is undertaken by poets to produce a different kind of vindicating force for data. He said poetry is its own vindicating force. As readers or listeners, we submit to an achieved form whereby the poet is credited with a power to open unexpected and unedited communications between our nature and the nature of the reality we inhabit. This is what art can do with data. It can open up new communications that can break over new possibilities for the respect of human rights within migration. So therefore, as we make arguments for migration governance, I'd like to end by also uh, making a plea for the ungovernance, for the ungovernable commons of the arts, for freedom of expression to truly be freedom of expression and to be part of the work that UNESCO has undertaken for years in respecting tangible and intangible cultural heritage of migrants and bringing cultural justice into the fore. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alison, for the concise presentation. I want to thank all of you for answering my questions very well. We now want to take the questions from the panel, uh, the participants. So I encourage the participants to put their questions in the chat box, and then we will read them. So far, we have one question, and that question uh, is from Dennis Osei, who wants to know how COVID-19 has affected migration governance. In the interest of time, I want the panelists to just be very brief. Don't spend more than one minute in answering the question. So I will send that question to Mr. Charles Alan Queen, just one minute uh, to tell us something about how to respond to Dennis, the fact of COVID-19 on migration governance. Mr. Queen. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Thanks. Well, the COVID-19, as we all know, um, has affected uh, societies and everyone regardless of how developed a country is or de uh, regardless of how rich a person is. But I must say that the most severe impact affected those who were already on the move, especially migrants and asylum seekers who normally you know, work in the informal sector, especially during the lockdowns. So really the impact was not only socioeconomic, it was health, it was socioeconomic, and it was also a matter of uh, protection. At the same time, governments needed to take coordinated approaches to address it. But the impact is really a very severe, affecting even remittances. So for Dennis, I must say that the COVID-19 has had a very grievous impact on migrants, especially undocumented migrants who could not even access basic social services, even when they were available. 
even as we talk about vaccination, they are excluded. As we talk of information, health services, and uh, I mean, social uh, uh, safety nets, they are excluded in many countries. So indeed it has very serious impact and government should endeavor to ensure that migrants are included in social safety nets, including vaccination and uh, stimulus packages. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for being very concise. So there is a question from Matthew Warshaw, which is also related to a question I was going to post to the panelists. So I will combine it with my own question. That our question is simply to find out how gender issues are addressed in the implementation of those policies. So he acknowledged that the gender issues are in the African migration policy framework, but in practice, are the people implementing them? So we will send our question to Peter. Peter, if you can briefly comment on that one, whether on the ground governments are able to ensure that the, in the implementation of the policies, gender issues are taken into consideration. Peter? Yes, um, uh, th thank, thank you. Uh, um, yes, um, as you know, um, our um, uh, major document in terms of, uh, um, you know, migration, our position on migration uh, is, uh, you know, based in the um, AU migration policy framework uh, for Africa. Um, and we, we um, quite, you know, concerted, you know, efforts uh, to ensure that uh, issues of gender I think we have lost Peter. So we send the same question to Tony. Tony, can you respond to the same question? Yes, I, I'll attempt. <laughs> um, if you look at it, it's not that the policies are not there. There are lots of instruments in terms of uh, mainstreaming gender. If you recall in my presentation, I mentioned under the common approach, you have also the the, that element in terms of mainstreaming gender, in terms of migration Hello, policies. Joseph. And um, can I continue? Yeah, continue. Peter, okay. uh, Peter uh, Tony is continuing for you since we lost you, so it's OK. OK. After that, right. you can come in. Yeah, okay. Tony. And, and then also uh, the regional migration policy. You see, there are instruments, but the most important thing is having to make sure that people respect text. For example, in terms of border management, you find that you have few women doing the enforcement. In terms of uh, policy development, you call for a meeting, you, you see it's, the meetings are not gender sensitive, but the, the, the rules and regulation also provides the mechanism for development, for the, for the developing this policy and also enforcement. If you go to our land borders, you really find you, the number of women, ladies there is so, is, and you find that at times in some borders, men are even searching women. Then our borders should also be gender friendly. They, they should also have places where um, migrants or travelers um, who have different needs in terms of women having to have a place for them to even take up their children. But the most important that permit me now to even cross to the COVID, um, you see the, the COVID era brought into focus they need to mainstream health issues in border management. So it is very, very important that we do not wait for things to happen before we start working in that. Just like we keep, we keep complaining about mainstreaming gender in this particular issue until something happens. So it is not that the tests are not there, but the enforcement, the implementation, the respect to tests. Um, let me now allow my, my, my brother, Peter, to that uh, continue with what he's saying. But it is very important for us to, we have the best tests in Africa. I would just say, I can beat my chest that we have good tests, but also we do not respect tests. Thank you so much. So Peter, can you conclude on what you were saying? Uh, yes, um, I, I was kicked out you know, there by the system, or maybe it's my network here. Um, but as I was saying, um, um, our, you know, implement, implementing document in terms of migration uh, is the uh, AU migration policy uh, framework for Africa, uh, which uh, when we revised it uh, in 2016-2017, uh, we 
we made it a point that we include uh, gender issues, um, which is not only about, you know, uh, uh, women, also, you know, men, you know, how um, men and women uh, are impacted um, uh, by migration uh, during, you know, the um, the whole, you know, cycle of uh, migration. And uh, we've also made it a point that um, uh, member states, uh, as they do their own migration policy uh, um, uh, frameworks, um, they um, embrace uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, thematic areas or cross-cutting issues uh, that are uh, in the MPFA, and that includes, uh, you know, gender issues as well. Um, but Joseph, I, I just wanted to touch also on the issue of COVID-19, you know, uh, just, just, you know, half a minute. Yes, half a minute, please. Go ahead for half a minute, yes, um, please. Okay, um, now uh, the end of uh, COVID-19 actually has resulted um, in countries, you know, tightening, uh, you know, their borders. Uh, and in some cases, you know, uh, closing the borders. And uh, this has negatively impacted uh, on those migrants that rely on cross-border trade, uh, you know, for their livelihoods. And um, this uh, tended to increase irregular migration, you know, with uh, people trying to avoid, you know, the designated, you know, crossing post. Um, and also further, uh, this has uh, provided an opportunity for, you know, migrants, you know, smugglers, uh, moving people um, that have just, you know, to cross, you know, that border. Uh, for one reason or another. Um, and um, as, as the commission, in terms of response, um, last year we drafted a paper on migration and health uh, in preparation for establishment. So we have lost Peter again. Now we will move on to a question for Alison, and uh, that is a question that has been asked by one or two people, including the Lali. So they like the artistic methodology and they're asking how can we ensure that we present that one to policymakers and researchers. And then they are also asking, combine that with my own question, how can we ensure that policymakers use the data that we produce and send to them? So, yeah, so I think, um, I, thanks Joseph, and those are great questions. Um, my answer is always by doing it. Um, so um, policymakers like to stay comfortable in their policy spaces, but actually also really enjoy the disruption of arts when it comes. And I think done well and held well, bringing policymakers into art making activities, which are not about producing world class elite art, but are about the process of generating different perspectives in the world. And I think the arts have a real um, ability to enable empathy. And the empathy is part of what is needed to mainstream gender, for example, as Tony was saying, but is also what is needed to change a way of doing things. We, change, we, we will get better outcomes if we change how we do things, but to change how we do things, we have to change how we do things. So we have to do it using other things. And sometimes for me, that means, um, a little bit of ambushing um, in a context of policy making and bringing in a tone or a mood or a cloth or something that people aren't quite expected, which can then disrupt just in a very gentle way. Um, so that you might suddenly move from hearing about policy making and outcomes and targets and frameworks and timelines to hearing someone saying, there's no one to check you in or check you out. No one to weigh your baggage or touch you up. No body in booth, hands above head, feet behind line. There's no herd of herd of people. No holding pens, no paper cuts, no board, no number, no pass, no gate. There's no priority clearance, no catwalk for the privileged. For now, in a manner of speaking, in a matter of seconds, we're across the frontier, border crossing in Togo. 
that's an extract from a poem by my Maidek colleague, Tawana Sitole, about the day we got lost on the border between Ghana and Togo and find that we crossed an international border without being searched or stripped or interviewed. And I think sometimes that poetry language can just shift the narrative a little, even in policy spaces, and is quite welcome as a breather, a space to move away from doing things just one way, but allowing us to do things many ways. Thank you so much, Alison. So we have a question here, a question from Jampo, which I'm going to combine with another question for Mr. Queenie. So how difficult it is to achieve integration. And so I'm sure he's talking about harmonization, given that he said, given that every country has their own system of dealing with migration issues. Uh, in line with that, Mr. Queenie, you can answer that and also add some of the challenges in working with governments. So you have IOM frameworks that are supposed to be implemented in different countries. What are the challenges working with governments to ensure that they do these things in line with these international standards? Mr. Queen. Mr. Queen. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Prof. Peng. Uh, firstly, the challenges of our integration. One, that is part and parcel of the AU Agenda 2063, the Africa we would want to have. But having said that, I think it's easier said than done because Africa happens to be arguably perhaps the most closed continent in terms of human mobility. Despite the fact that people, most people live within the regions that they live, the restrictions in border, uh, in human mobility and migration undermines the integration that we want. That is, uh, be it regional integration or economic integration. That has actually limited intra-Africa trade. When we look at global trade in Europe, it's over 70% because they have Schengen, they trade amongst themselves. You look at Asia, over 40%. In Africa, it's just about 16% because we do not trade much amongst ourselves. So we have to unpack that and integrate facilitating uh, human mobility, including issues such as one-stop border post to facilitate trade if we really want to achieve uh, regional integration. Now, when it comes to challenges that we face supporting governments, uh, I also there are a number of issues. One, the whole perception of migration. Many governments see migration from security point of view. They see migration and for that matter migrants as a problem. But migration is not a problem to be solved. It's a human reality to be managed. So it's important that governments really understand that because there seems to be more investment in preventing and controlling migration, which is not an easy thing to do instead of investing in uh, the development side of migration. Secondly, the issue of capacity of governments to implement policies that they formulate. At the same time, the resources to implement that. Three, the issue of coordination. Migration is a very broad subject, it's multifaceted. Different aspects of migration are dealt with by different ministries. So there is the need for coherence. We have many governments whose national development priority would be say promoting uh, tourism by the Ministry of Trade or Tourism. At the same time, you have your Minister of Home Affairs who have very restrictive, I mean, uh, immigration policies, including visas and, uh, you know, visa application systems. So no matter how much you invest in tourism, your Home Affairs Ministry is undermining it. So there is that need for coordination. There is also the issue of um, the rapid rate of turnover and data. More often than not, there are no data to underpin government policies. And a lot of the things we hear are empirical, sorry, are anecdotal. So there is the need for data harmonization. Even during this uh, COVID, uh, throughout this process, harmonization of policies do not exist. To go to one country, they are talking of maybe 72 hours of COVID test. Another country, you need uh, 10 days or I mean 15 days. So the issue of coordination, harmonization has been a major challenge working with governments, the capacity and resources. And at the same time, the rate of turnover where you have a government dealing with one government ministry, the next moment of an office has been changed. Uh, these are some of the key uh, challenges that we have to address. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, all the panelists, for the brief answers. We also want to thank all the participants for the questions. We, our time is almost up, so we want to end, but we want to give the panelists the chance to make just one uh, policy contribution for going forward with uh, better migration governance. So each panelist should just use 30 seconds. And I will start with Mr. Quinn, just one thing that we you think we should do well in Africa to move migration governance. Well, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, one policy uh, agenda that I would recommend is for government to see migration as a development enabler and try to harness the developmental aspects of migration to maximize the benefits of migration and to reduce the negative aspects rather than seeing migration as a problem to be solved and rather putting in a lot of efforts and investment in controlling and preventing migration instead of actually investing in the development aspects. So that is the policy should be more pro progressive rather than retrogative policies. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. I will now move on to Professor Alison Pips for just one recommendation. Yes, um, develop cultural justice policies for migration governance. Thank you so much. You have been over concise. <laughs> so thank you so much. This is very concise. So policies that will uh, recognize the culture and diversity, that is very, very important. Then Peter, if you are back, one last recommendation, Peter. Peter, okay, maybe Peter's network is still not stable. Uh, Tony, one last recommendation. Okay, I, I just want uh, government to take um, uh, ownership of migration. And taking ownership is also involve um, even budgeting for them. It is not alien. They should take ownership of migration, mainstream them in every policy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we want to thank you again, our panelists. You have done so well. We also want to thank the participants for the very thought-provoking questions that you have asked. I want to repeat again that the event will be available to watch again next week. So you can follow us on Twitter and also you can retweet, you can tweet the presentation. So we want to thank everyone. You agree with me that this has been an exciting webinar. We've learned a lot. The participation has been great. We want to thank our interpreters for doing a good job. We also want to thank our organizer, the technical team. We have had a very nice start uh, due to the fact that the technical team has done so well. So we want to thank the technical team again. Heidi and Craig, you were behind the scenes. You put everything in place. Everything has been very well. I uh, want to end here by saying bye-bye in our local language. That is bye-bye-bye to all of you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.